Hello everyone and welcome back to Stock Explorers. Great to be here. Today we're doing a deep dive into Redwire Corporation. Uh, definitely a name that's been popping up for potential investors. Mm -hmm. We're aiming to really unpack what they do, cover the latest news, look at the, you know, the pros and cons from an investment angle and flag what milestones you should be watching. Yeah, and we'll try to break it down with some clear examples, keep it engaging, but you know, still focused on the investment side of things. Right. We want to give you a solid perspective on Redwire, drawing from, well, quite a bit of information we've looked at. It's about getting beyond just the headlines, really understanding the core factors you need to consider if you're thinking about this stock. Okay, let's jump right in. Mm. The most recent thing seems to be this successful delivery and onboard computer for the European Space Agency's Comet Interceptor mission. That's right. Yeah, that hit the news recently. And it looks like it gave the stock a little bump, too. It did, yeah. Positive reaction there. So, okay, let's back up a bit. What exactly is Redwire's main business? Why is something like delivering a computer for ESA, why is that significant? Well, fundamentally, Redwire is positioned as um, what you might call a picks and shovels provider for the space economy. Picks and shovels. Okay. Like in a gold rush. Exactly that analogy. Instead of betting on one specific mission or outcome, they supply the essential technologies and infrastructure that a lot of different space ventures need. Ah, I see. So they're selling the gear everyone needs, regardless of who strikes gold. Precisely. Their success isn't tied to just one company succeeding. They provide foundational stuff. Got it. Can you give some concrete examples of these uh, picks and shovels? Sure. Uh, a really visible one is their solar power tech. IROSA, the rollout solar arrays. Oh, yeah. The ones for the ISS power upgrade. That's them. Big, expandable solar panels, really boosting the station's power. Uh, they're also strong in in-space 3D printing. Which is becoming more important, right, for yeah. manufacturing up there. Absolutely. Making parts, tools, even research materials directly in orbit. Then you have their avionics, the brains, the control systems for spacecraft. Okay. Like their instrument control unit for ESA's next generation gravity mission. That's for mapping Earth's gravity field really accurately. And the ADPM S3, that's the advanced data and power management system. That was the actual computer for Comet Interceptor we just mentioned. Okay, so core electronics. Core electronics, yeah. And finally, things like docking mechanisms, critical stuff. They're providing the International Birthing and Docking Mechanism, the IBDM, for NASA's Gateway. Gateway, the lunar outpost. The very one. So yeah, crucial hardware for major projects. That's quite a range. Very um, essential sounding technologies. And who are they selling all this to? Is it just NASA and ESA? No, it's broader than that, which is a strength. Obviously, NASA and ESA are huge clients, but they also work with commercial companies. Think phases, Lania Space. Partnering on Gateway. Right. And is Space US for lunar stuff? Virgin Galactic, they're doing work for their new ships and intuitive machines, too. Remember their recent moon lander? Redwire Tech was on board. Wow. Okay. So a pretty diverse customer list. That probably helps reduce risk, doesn't it? Definitely. Spreads the reliance. They're not betting everything on one agency or program. Now, you mentioned big developments. There's this acquisition that's been talked about quite a bit. Edge Autonomy. Yes, that's a major piece of news. The impending acquisition of Edge Autonomy. What's the significance there? Why is that such a big deal? Well, it's potentially transformative. It basically shifts Redwire from being, you know, primarily a space technology company. Which is what we've been discussing. Right. Into becoming a multi-domain provider. Yeah. So space and uncrewed airborne systems, drones, basically. Uh, okay, so expanding beyond space entirely. Exactly. Edge Autonomy has a solid track record in UAVs, uncrewed aerial vehicles. This opens up whole new markets, especially defense. There could be some interesting synergies between space and air systems, too. When is that expected to happen? They're targeting a close in Q2 2025, so pretty soon. There's a shareholder meeting set for June 9th to vote on it. Okay, something to watch. And this is tied into their growth outlook. Very much so. It's a key reason behind some of the more optimistic revenue forecasts for next year. All right. That sets the scene well. We understand the business, the recent news, this big acquisition on the horizon. Let's pivot to the positives. Why might an investor look at Redwire and see opportunity? What are the growth drivers? Okay. Well, the most immediate one is that projected revenue growth for 2025 we just touched on. Right. Tied to the acquisition. Exactly. They're forecasting um, 
somewhere between $535 million and $605 million. That's a really significant jump from 2024 levels, assuming edge autonomy closes as planned. That's a big leap. And analysts seem generally positive. I saw a moderate buy rating mentioned. Yeah, the consensus is sort of cautiously optimistic. Analysts see the strategic potential in the growing space market, but they're also you know, keeping an eye on current profitability issues. So moderate buy reflects that balance potential upside, but maybe some bumps along the way. Okay. What else points towards growth? Well, their contract backlog looks pretty solid. Uh -huh. Just looking at their European operations, as of the end of March 2025, they had over $107 million in contracted work still to deliver. That shows good traction internationally. It does. It shows they're expanding beyond the U.S. and diversifying their revenue geographically. And it's not just the number of contracts, but the type. Working with Thales Alenia on Gateway, like we said, puts them in critical future infrastructure. Partnering with companies like Ispace US positions them for that whole commercial lunar market that's starting to take off. And it seems like they're constantly winning new deals across different areas. They are quite active, yeah. We mentioned the Thales deal for gateway docking mechanisms. There's the MOU, the understanding with Ispace US for moon missions. With ESA, it's quite broad. The Gravity Mission Avionics design work for Arrakis. Arrakis. What's that? That's a mission concept to study dark matter. So quite cutting edge stuff. Plus the Comet Interceptor computer and even early work on a potential Mars spacecraft called Lightship Mars. Wow. Okay. Then uh, for Virgin Galactic, they're supplying research payload lockers for the new Delta spaceships. For NASA, they're involved in in-space pharma development things called Peelbox and the Industrial Crystallizer. Even a cancer detection experiment called Golden balls. Golden balls, really? Yep. And for the U.S. Space Force, they're building Mako spacecraft to test on-orbit refueling. We talked about the IROSA upgrades for the ISS. They're partnering with a company called Phase 4 on advanced electric propulsion Hall effect thrusters. And their Sentinel cam was on that intuitive machines land. Okay, okay. It's almost hard to keep track. It really drives home that picks and shovels point. Yeah. They're everywhere. Pretty much. They're embedded in a lot of key programs, both government and commercial. Does this breath translate into a specific strategy? Yes, and that's another positive point. They're deliberately focusing on high growth areas. In space manufacturing is a big one. Pharma, material science, bioprinting is another. The 3D printing of biological tissues. Exactly. They've hit some impressive milestones there, like printing heart tissue constructs and even part of a meniscus in space. That's really pushing the envelope. That sounds very futuristic. It is, but it has real potential. Also, they're developing platforms for a very low Earth orbit, VLEO, like something called SaberSat. That could be important for defense, for Earth observation, areas closer to Earth than traditional orbits. So they're not just supplying current missions, they're actively building tech for what's next. That's the idea. They want to be positioned for future growth trends. And again, that underlying picks and shovels strategy gives them broad exposure. If the whole space economy grows, especially with things like Starship potentially enabling much larger scale activities, Redwire stands to benefit. Some people even connect them to potential defense projects. There's some speculation around potential benefits from large defense initiatives, yeah. And, you know, you hear chatter sometimes that maybe Redwire is a bit of a hidden gem, perhaps undervalued compared to some other big names like Rocket Lab. Interesting. Any other financial positives worth noting? Yeah, a significant one. Earlier this year, they successfully redeemed all their public warrants. What does that mean, practically? It brought in about $82.9 million in cash, which is great for liquidity and financial flexibility. It also simplifies their capital structure, which investors generally like. Fewer complex instruments floating around. Okay. Cleaner balance sheet, more cash. Basically. And finally, you've got some positive recognition for their leadership. Peter Canito, the CEO, was nominated for Satellite Executive of the Year. And Dr. Kenneth Savin, involved in their biotech work, made the Time 100 health list. That kind of stuff can help boost confidence. All right, so definitely a lot to like there. Strong growth projections, diverse customer base, key tech, strategic focus. But every investment has risks. We need the other side of the coin. What are the concerns? <laughs> The negative aspects. Absolutely. A balanced view is essential. Uh, the first thing that jumps out is their recent financial performance, specifically Q1 2025. What happened there? They missed revenue expectations. And more significantly, revenue was down year over year by about 30%. Ouch. Why? 
The company attributed it mainly to delays in U.S. government contract awards, which highlights a key risk, right? Reliance on government funding cycles, those can be unpredictable. Budgets shift, programs get delayed. So a vulnerability there, that kind of drop would definitely worry investors. It would. And alongside that, their adjusted EBITDA, a measure of operating profitability, also declined in Q1 compared to the previous year. Hmm. What about overall profit? Are they making money? Well, their net loss actually improved slightly in Q1 2025 compared to Q1 2024, which is a small positive. But they do have a history of overall net losses. Achieving consistent, sustained profitability is still something the market is waiting to see. So profitability is a persistent question mark. It is. And complicating that picture, you sometimes see significant non-cash charges and these things called EAC adjustments, mm -hmm. estimate at completion. It's basically revising the expected total cost and therefore profit of a long-term contract. If those adjustments are unfavorable, it means costs are higher or revenues lower than initially planned on specific projects. It can signal execution issues or cost overruns. And make the underlying performance harder to read. Exactly. These adjustments can muddy the waters a bit when you're trying to figure out the core operational health. Okay. And then there's the edge autonomy deal again. We talked about the potential upside, but what are the risks associated with that? Right. It's not all positive. There are actually ongoing investigations related to the merger. Investigations. Into what? Potential securities fraud allegations and whether the deal is fair to Redwire's existing minority shareholders. That sounds serious. It can be. Hmm. Investigations like that create uncertainty, potential legal costs, and obviously reputational damage. It's definitely something that makes investors nervous. Understandably. And then there's the structure of the deal itself. A lot of it is being paid for with red wire stock. Which means dilution for existing shareholders. Potentially, yes. Issuing new shares can reduce the ownership percentage of existing holders. And tied to this, AE Industrial Partners, the private equity firm that's heavily involved, is set to significantly increase its ownership stake. How much? Up to around 65%, giving them majority control and more seats on the board. Wow, 65% control. That raises governance questions, doesn't it? It does. Concerns about the influence of a single majority shareholder, potential conflicts of interest, and whether decisions will always prioritize all shareholders equally. That's a key governance aspect to watch post-acquisition. We've also seen the stock price itself be quite volatile. And earlier in 2025, it underperformed the wider aerospace and defense sector for periods. Plus, there's a pretty significant level of short interest. How significant? Around 19% of the float, last I checked. That means nearly one-fifth of the publicly traded shares are being borrowed by investors betting the price will fall. 19% is high. That shows considerable bearish sentiment out there. It does. It's a red flag, or at least a yellow one, indicating skepticism from a notable part of the market. Any other earthly challenges, as you put it earlier? Well, just the general execution risks that come with complex engineering projects. Yeah. Things can go wrong, schedules can slip, costs can overrun. There have been comments about potential project management weaknesses in the past, and that reliance on government funding always looms. Budgets change, priorities shift. Right, and have analysts reacted to these recent results? Some have lowered their earnings estimates. Roth Capital, for instance, trimmed their Q2 EPS forecast. And it's maybe worth remembering, there was a past investor settlement connected to accounting issues at one of their subsidiaries, LoadPath. That's in the history books, but it's part of the record. Okay, so a mix of financial performance concerns, risks tied to the big acquisition, governance questions, and general execution challenges. A lot to weigh against the positives. Definitely, it's not a straightforward picture. So looking forward now, what should investors be tracking? What are the key milestones that will tell us how Redwire is navigating these opportunities and challenges. Okay, several things stand out. First and foremost, the closing of that edge autonomy acquisition, that's expected in Q2, so very soon. Just getting the deal done. Step one. Step two is the integration. How effectively do they combine the two businesses? Can they actually realize those projected revenue increases and cost savings, the synergies that they're promising? That's crucial. Seeing the plan turn into reality. Exactly. Then keep an eye on their bid pipeline. They've talked about having around $4.1 billion in potential contracts they're bidding on. Wow, that's a huge number. It is. But the key is converting that pipeline into actual signed contracts. Seeing that conversion rate will be important for future revenue visibility. Makes sense. What about those future looking areas? Progress there is key too. Mm -hmm. In space manufacturing, bioprinting, 
Are they announcing new partnerships? Are they moving towards actual commercial applications for these technologies? That's where a lot of the long-term excitement lies. Right, moving from R&D to revenue. Precisely. Also, the outcomes of major contract bids, especially big government ones, mm -hmm. if they land a significant role in a major program, that could be a big catalyst. And the ongoing projects. Need to see success there, too. Successful launches, hitting operational milestones for things like the Gateway Docking System, the NGGM Avionics, Iraqi H, Comet Interceptor, the Mako spacecraft for the Space Force, continued IROSA deployments, basically showing they can deliver on their current commitments. A lot of moving parts. And financially, what's the big goal? Profitability. Analysts are projecting potential gap profitability, that's standard accounting profit, possibly by 2026. Hitting that target would be a massive milestone. Okay. So watching the quarterly results for revenue growth and improving margins, generating positive cash flow, all leading towards that profitability goal. Yes. All the standard financial metrics will be scrutinized. And um, just watching the market's reaction once the edge autonomy deal is fully integrated and AE Industrial Partners takes that controlling stake, how does the market digest that new reality? That's a good point. And finally, decisions on future ESA missions they're involved in, like that Iraqi IHS dark matter mission study. ESA is expected to decide whether to adopt it as a full mission around mid-2026. A go decision there would be a significant win for Redwire's European side. Okay, quite a few things to keep tabs on over the next year or two. Absolutely, it's a dynamic situation. So let's try to wrap this up. Redwire seems to offer this um, compelling story of growth potential, right? deeply involved in the expanding space sector, now moving into defense, too, with edge autonomy. Yeah, the potential narrative is strong. They're positioned in growing markets with critical technologies. But, and, and it's a significant but, there are these real risks and uncertainties. Near-term financial performance has been shaky. Profitability is still a goal, not a reality. And this big acquisition brings both opportunity and, well, governance questions and execution risks. That sums it up well. You've got the exciting potential upside, driven by market growth and strategic moves, but it's balanced against tangible challenges, particularly around financial execution and the implications of the new ownership structure. So for you, the listener, thinking about this as a potential investment, it really comes down to weighing those two sides carefully. Mm -hmm. You need to consider the growth story, the picks and shovels advantage, the new markets against the recent financial stumbles, the history of losses, the dilution risk, and the governance factors. Absolutely. It's definitely not a simple yes or no. As always, we have to stress, do your own thorough research. Dig deeper into the numbers, understand the risks fully, and think about how this fits or doesn't fit with your own investment goals and how much risk you're comfortable taking. Couldn't agree more. Due diligence is key here. Well, thank you for joining us on Stock Explorers for this detailed look at Redwire Corporation. We hope this breakdown was helpful. I hope so, too. If you found this valuable, please do subscribe to our channel for more deep dives like this one. Give us a like. It really helps us out. And make sure you hit that notification bell so you don't miss our future analyses. Thanks for listening.